How's it going, guys? I'm Connor from Running Warehouse, and we're back with episode 10 of the Running Warehouse Connection, our weekly show where we bring the running community together to talk about anything and everything running related. Now, this week we have another shoe reviewer, and this is special because this is a face you don't get to see on camera too often. We have Sam from Road Trail Run. Sam, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Connor. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to say hi here from Park City, Utah. I was just up on the trails right behind me here on the background. So we'll be talking a lot of cool things and uh, uh, I'll let uh, Connor lead me on. I got lots to show you, a lot of, lot of stuff. Well, we're excited, Sam. And I know a lot of people watching today have probably read one of your reviews at some point, but they may not know who you are or just how long you've been in the running shoe game. So Sam, give us some background on yourself. Okay, well, uh, you can see I got some gray hair. I, as I was thinking about uh, today's, um, today's uh, uh, Zoom call, I realized that I've been running next year or maybe the year after is going to be 50 years I've been running. So I still enjoy it as much as I did the first, well, after the first few uh, uh, runs around a ball field in junior high in New Hampshire. So... Uh, my background in running was, uh, it was something I was kind of forced to do. Um, I liked the hike. I was not a very athletic kind of kid at all. And I went to a, a private school where when you were freshman, uh, you were tested for your physical abilities, throw the ball, broad jump, six, and you know, I was near the bottom. So I think I was third from the bottom. But you had to do sports for five days a week and six if you were on a team, which was gonna be unlikely for me. So all I really could do, uh, think about doing was running. And I enjoyed hiking, I enjoyed being in the mountains. So I started running um, the, in, in uh, 71 or 72. Had a wonderful high school coach, he was a legend. He'd been around since the 30s we had. And of course, he realized that there were a lot of kids who weren't gonna play hockey, football, squash, whatever, he picked them all up and turned into runners. But, and it's kind of cool because what Connor has right behind him there, uh, at the same time in my hometown of Exeter, New Hampshire, Nike arrived with their original R&D and their original manufacturing and development. And since I was passionate about running, and I, uh, one of my near neighbors was sort of the guru for, every, for Nike. He didn't work for him. He was just a school teacher. But he had been on the military uh, distance team. And he brought a lot of the original people to Nike in New Hampshire. And we all ran together. I was the kid. Uh, they weren't much older. They were in their 20s. So I had a basis in track and cross country, but also longer distance running while I was still in high school. During those years, uh, particularly at the Nike years and after, uh, I was able to run in basically the first kind of golden age of running shoes, which included, of course, the original Tiger Marathon, you know, which dates back even to, I think, into the late 60s. That's what we ran in cross country in high school and also in track. And then a little bit later on um, in some of the, all the early Nikes uh, that they put together, I had one pair that I fondly remember. I wish I still had it. It still, it wouldn't be compared to today's, but it would be awesome. Yeah, I think it was an Obori that my friends at Nike waffled for me. So it had a bit more cushioning than the Tiger Marathon and it had grip. So, and a bit more cushion from the outsole. So I ran that thing for years and years, just about everything. Uh, a little bit later on, the early 80s, um, after college, uh, I forget the exact, I think 79 might have been the tailwind. So I ran the original tail, tailwind, there was the LDV. And then my marathon PR was in the Air Mariah, which when you think about it, compared to what came before the Tiger Marathons or even my special Nike, uh, was a very highly cushioned shoe. It had, it had a considerably higher stack than what we've been running in before and the air cushion. So 
that that one led me, even though it was unstable as heck and they didn't last very long, but it led me to my uh, my marathon PR of 228 in Montreal. So, and then just a little bit more. How did I get to road trail run? Well, after the mid 80s, I was, uh, uh, I worked uh, in a family business for 10 years. And within one year, I went from a 230 marathoner to uh, barely, barely under four. I worked that hard, night and day. Um, and over time, kids and careers, startups, other things, I still ran, but I was heavier and slower. And when I turned 50, things in life got a little smoother and I really started running again. And I started Road Trail Run in about 2005 as sort of a technology and running blog uh, because I'd been involved in the technology business. Uh, but I was always still fascinated by the running shoes. That's, you know, I really started early in them. And that's where it started, uh, 2005. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the um, early, you know, if I look back, uh, say 2009, 10, the original Hoka's, took them hiking around the Mont Blanc. Uh, and then from there, we've evolved. Um, I have a wonderful team of writers. World, they're really worldwide from Singapore to Angola, Africa, now Australia, Germany, all parts of the U.S. And we're all passionate runners and shoe geeks. We have many different speeds. You know, I say our um, writers skew maybe a bit older maybe than, than uh, some of the other sites. Um, but we have uh, folks that have won their age group in, uh, in uh, Berlin and um, New York, placed second in New York, another person. Um, and so it's a wonderful crew and I keep them all coordinated and, and uh, find the good stuff for them to try because they're passionate. Awesome. awesome. So you've been involved with the running shoe world really since the early 70s when Nike all began and you tested a lot of those shoes and over the years you've tested pretty much, you know, a large amount of the shoes that have gone onto the market. What do you say is the biggest change you've seen from the seventies to the modern super shoes we see today? Well, a couple, a couple things. Um, you know, I mentioned the Air Mariah, which was, if I remember a decently cushioned shoe, um, the materials have gotten way, way more durable. Uh, the foams, the uppers, uh, the uppers, and, and we can talk about the uppers at some point, continue to evolve in comfort. Um, now with the super shoes, you're seeing very, very lightweight foams, um, the, the, the PEBA type foams in the Saucony Endorphin, the Zumex, and they're very light, they're resilient, tons of cushioning, but they require some stabilizing, some help to keep that all together. Some of that comes from the plate, but also a lot of it, I think, also comes from the outsole design. I th one, one thing I encourage my reviewers to think about, and I always do, is most outsoles, not all, are very durable. What role does the outsole, midsole play in the overall ride, stability and even cushion of the shoe because they really are built as a as a system and some of them are done brilliantly some are not as good some are so they, i i don't know because i haven't you know gotten in deep with the brands but i imagine a lot of attention goes into that element and that's critical also in with the super shoes and the super foams yeah, you know, the outsole, I think, is a part of the shoe you kind of take for granted, you don't think about, but a lot goes in, and especially now when we're seeing a lot of exposed mid, uh, midsoles, um, utilize, um, working together with the outsole materials, there's a lot that goes into it when you're looking at weight, durability, traction, so, you know, that, that's an important part, but let's move this conversation on now. You're the shoe expert, so let, let's dive on in. What are your favorite shoes right now? Let's start off with top trainers. Uh, what's your go-to currently? Well, uh, as you could, uh, last year I think I ran in about 90 different shoes. Okay, I run about 30 to 40 miles a week, so it's sometimes sad I got to leave a great shoe behind for another great shoe. But uh, if you're looking at the last six months or so, um, top of the list, uh, 
the um, Saucony endorphin speed and the New Balance fuel cell TC. They're, they're, they get to the same place, but in, a little, in different ways. The um, endorphin speed, which is coming out soon, I've run quite a bit in. Uh, it's very light, 7.8 ounces. It has a nylon type plate instead of a carbon plate, whereas our fuel cell TC has a carbon plate with the fuel cell foam. The, fuel, the TC is con considerably heavier, I think about two ounces heavier, but it, but it has a bouncier heel and its carbon plate is really nicely propulsive. They basically are tra fast trainers that you potentially could train in every day. I do caution the folks on using carbon plated shoes all the time. I think you need to mix it up. So the nylon plate in the speed is softer and less rigid. Um, you're not gonna lose much in speed over the pro. Uh, so a little, a little softer feeling. Um, so those are the two speed ones. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go off the reservation here with something. Um, the Pegasus uh, 37, uh, uh, and here we have the women's edition, and oh boy, it looks very, looks wise, very similar. Here's the men's. Now, I ran in the men's 37, and it's a shoe that I think really takes a particular runner. It has sort of a very distinct character. Most of our testers, uh, except one of our, our heaviest tester, kind of thought the airbag was awkward and they were quite firm. So I got a pair of the women's in a size uh, 10 women's, D width, so equivalent to my eight and a half men's. And this, the women's is a different shoe. <laughs> it looks the same, but it's a different riding shoe. Uh, the foam is softer. Uh, clearly to touch and running. The airbag, which Nike talked a lot about uh, 20 PSI in the men's, 15 in the women's. Well, the 15 gives you a much smoother transition. You don't lose much in cushioning. And I think you, you increase in kind of road feel and response. They're lighter and really cool. The upper is similar, but a lighter kind of the same mesh, so the weight goes down. Uh, the, the Pegasus 37 women, for a guy, if you can find the size, and I hope Running Warehouse gets a bunch more in, <laughs> is a great daily trainer, kind of an all-arounder uh, for me. Then let's move to uh, uh, kind of heavier duty shoes. Uh, I mentioned the endorphin um, uh, speed. Well, I really like the endorphin shift, which is also coming soon. So uh, it doesn't have the PEBA, uh, the Power Run PB midsole. It's the Power Run midsole. Now, what, what this shoe does, though, is it, it still has the speed roll rocker. And it's almost kind of the most distinct rocker of the bunch uh, for me. Um, and you'll also notice over here, the heel counter cup comes way down. It doesn't come down as far on the lateral side. And there's some extra kind of rubber from the outsole uh, as sort of a stability element. It's a neutral shoe, but um, it has a, a very light stability element. It's a heavy duty trainer. I think people are gonna love it. It's, it's sort of on the firmer side, but it's not in no way harsh. So if you're a, uh, I think if you're going to be, if you're a, a stability oriented runner, support runner, and you want to get rid of posts and things like that, or rails even, it's going to be a great option. Yeah. And then finally, uh, this <laughs> one's going to surprise you, okay? We're talking trainers for the road, okay? But I, I always value versatility in a road shoe or a trail shoe. So this one is really cool. Uh, and yes, it's another Saucony. It's the uh, Exodus 10 trail shoe, okay? And it has a TPU midsole, the Power Run Plus. This shoe can do just about, it's heavy, it's over 11 ounces, but this shoe can do anything you throw at it, road or trail. It's super comfortable, it's stable, 
It's actually flexible despite the giant stack. A real surprise uh, in terms of a versatile trainer. So this is one you might get if you say, you know, I run some trails, I do some hiking, I need kind of a recovery shoe, something to do everything, a wonderful surprise. So those are trainers. Perfect. Well, it's, let's, let's head on back and discuss a little bit more into each of those. So endorphin speed and the fuel cell TC, I think those are two that have been gaining a lot of interest. And it makes sense because it's got the plate, it's got the responsive foam, and we're seeing that in racers over the past year, but this is the first time we're really seeing that in the training segment. So that's something that's got my interest, but the shift on the other hand, which is part of that endorphin collection does not have that plate. Um, can you talk about some of the differences in feel between those two shoes? Oh, sure. Um, so the shift is uh, the way it gets its, oops, I gotta move over here. The way it gets its rocker effect is uh, not through a plate, but through the geometry and the thickness of the power run foam. So it gets to the same place. It's not explode, you know, it doesn't have kind of an explosive response um, like you find in a plated shoe, the Speed or the TC or the, the Nikes, but it gets to the same place. There's a very distinct roll off the front. Um, another one that has a distinct roll or a distinct rocker would be the A6 Glide Ride. Here, it's, it's more final, the roll-off. And so what, what's kind of neat in a, is that all three Saucony endorphins have that same kind of final roll-off. Roll um, this one gets to it just with the firmness of the overall foam, no plate. The other two, the plate. So you'll feel a snappier, uh, more distinct uh, pop off in the pro, a little bit less in the speed, and here it's just the overall geometry of the foam, not the plate that's leading to it. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that the endorphin shift reminds them of the Bondi. Now, you look at them, they do have a similar look, but is there going to be a different feel between those two shoes? I have not run in a Bondi since version one. <laughs> no way. That's yeah. crazy. Sam, we got to get you a pair of Bondi's. <laughs> well, a lot of my crew have the Bondi. Um, what I didn't like about uh, early, some of the earlier Hocus, but believe me, they're changing in, in current and I expect future, is they, um, the Meta Rocker didn't really work for me. It took too much knee lift, uh, especially on uphills. And, you know, I'm old and, you know, okay, I can run under 140 for a half, and that's my annual goal, but it, I just took too much work. Um, I haven't tried the latest Bondi, um, but I, I, they've, been considered, they've improved the rocker geometries over time, and I expect they will improve them further. Evidence of that is the, um, the let me find it here, this is my wife's pair, uh, is the Clifton Edge a much more effective rocker than earlier Clifton's. I also have the Clifton 7 um, improved, but here the, the, this, it looks low, kind of, it, it works far better for me um, than prior uh, Hoka's. So the a rocker geometry, it must be a tricky thing to, to do. Um, and uh, Hoka's improving theirs uh, by the minute. So Bondi 7, why not? Yeah, and it, it's tough when you talk about rocker geometries because the variation in people's strides and gates, you know, not every rocker is going to work for every person. So it's interesting to hear that earlier versions maybe didn't work as well for you. But I heard you say you have an annual goal of trying to get under one hour and 40 minutes. So you are racing, you're doing halves. I take it you probably do some shorter races as well. What is going to be your top racer currently? Okay. Oh, it's so tough because we haven't raced in so long. <laughs> uh, uh, what I'm going to do in the next week or when the weather's cool enough is I'm going to do a, a certified course, time, chip time, go when you want race in Salt Lake uh, City on the Jordan River Parkway. It's really cool. Run Oyo, run on your own, I guess. Um, and I'm mulling it over. I've asked my readers what they think I should run in. Um, this is a 10K. I'll probably also do a 
uh, a half too later in the month before we go back to New Hampshire. Um, and I'm, I'm torn, I'm torn. Uh, my inst the, so far the poll quite, and oh, I should, I could go get it, but the poll is saying uh, endorphin pro. Uh, there's two or three votes for actually the Solomon Sonic 3 Accelerate, which would be high on my list. Uh, and of course, the one that I'm kind of most tempted because I think it's most suited to a flat uh, 10K for me would be the A6 Meta Racer. Uh, so when we were all up here in Park City under heavy quarantine, the downtown was really, really empty. Uh, and all the streets were completely empty. So I did a number of test runs up a bike path and then straight down Park Avenue, which you never can do, you know, there was nobody there. In all the contenders, I didn't have my next, or my uh, vapor flies with me. Um, and that was a hilly uphill, a couple hundred feet of climbing, about five miles, and then, you know, uh, two and a half miles up, 200 feet, and then downhill all the way, gradual. Um, and for that course, uh, the endorphin speed was the fastest shoe. Um, and uh, the ASIC struggled on the uphill. The reason is because it has a flatter uh, geometry to the, uh, to the rocker. It's a, it's a rock, not like the Carbon X, which is really flat, but this is a shoe, for me anyway, that favors a flatter course and a shorter distance. So very tempted for the 10K. The other thing about the Meta Racer, uh, a couple things, I'm gonna to touch on the upper later, but um, the foam at the heel here is really interesting. You notice how the uh, lateral side over, which is this, uh, oh, well, I can't point straight here, is um, uncovered without sole, right? So what this does is you have a, a bouncy, bouncy landing on the heel, and then you move to the to the uh, rubber that's um, in in the midfoot, and then to that big to that front plate which is in here. So it actually was fantastic on the flats and fantastic on the downhills. Tempted, this may be the one I try for the 10K. Likely, I would do the Endorphin Pro or Speed for the half, uh, half distance. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, I still, and some of uh, Derek Lee, our, our wonderful reviewer in Singapore, uh, in terms of the Nike um, offerings, and I'm, I'm hoping to get an Alpha Fly soon, um, both of us still prefer the very original Vaporfly, the baby blue one. Um, many said, oh, the upper doesn't support, your foot collapses, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? I think that was designed that way. Both of us thought that's the best of the bunch, uh, particularly for, uh, well, we ran, mar both of us ran marathons in them, but for shorter than a marathon, because you really get the effect of the drop in and the toe off from the combination of that upper that sort of collapses a bit and the, the foam and the plate. Um, I've enjoyed the next, it's, it's more cushioned, it's a bit flatter feeling, uh, but the one with the most personality and probably the most speed, for me anyway, was the original. I really enjoyed the original 4% as well. I still have my pair that's in pretty good condition. So. I still get some miles in that. And I, I agree, it, it was an amazing feel. And the next percent has its pluses and minuses. But even when you look at the next percent, and then you look at the alpha, which is next, which has even more cushioning, you always have trade-offs. Because when you get more cushioning, you get more weight. So I, I, I feel like whenever anyone asks me what's the best shoe, it, it really comes down to personal preference. But we're and, also... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that my, my last Boston qualifier was a 2018 day in the 30s, windy, very flat course. It was the first marathon of maybe 25 or 30 that I've done that the next day I ran. Uh, I can tell you when I ran 237 in high school, I think it was in an Adidas of some kind, not sure which. Uh, 
I could not walk for a week. And that was always the case. So these super foam shoes, the, their um, ability to keep your legs fresher. And during the race, I felt great all the way. I just got a little unstable. It got super windy at the end. There were many turns on the course, like 12, 12 per lap. And there were like five or six laps, 90 degree plus turns, very windy. It got a little unsteady for, you know, in the last half mile, just I was getting blown around and back on the heels. But they do preserve your legs. Legs, and that's the, the, the key thing, I think, in the performance advantage is the fresher legs longer. Yeah, well, whether we look at the Meta Racer, Endorphin, Vaporfly, even though there are different stack heights, they all have that super foam. And for someone maybe who hasn't tried one of these shoes yet, what do you think is the biggest difference between a super foam and a, a normal foam? I know you talk about recovery aspects, but is there, what about responsiveness? What's going to be the difference in feel between these, these foams? Yeah, well, the number one thing might be for me a little different. Um, all of the super foams, and that includes the hyperburst, are super light. You, you're going to get a shoe with a ton of cushioning at a weight on your foot that just doesn't seem possible. So they tend to, the weight just tends to disappear on the foot. In terms of the feel, if you haven't tried it, uh, they all have a groove. It, it, the original Vaporfly was very easy to find the groove. You, you, and, and you could get back into it instantly. You knew when you were out of it. So, so they, they all have a certain groove in how you position. I think it's more position your body to find their group, each individual group. They are not, it is not hard to find. All you need to do, and I've told people this a lot, let's say you get a new pair of these things, you're all eager to race them. Go for a four mile run close to your race pace and find the groove. Um, so the groove really comes to the, to where the plate, the geometry of the plate, and how, how to really activate the foam, the plate, and the whole shoe. So it, it's, they're all a little bit different, you know? Yeah, now you talk about your favorite racers, your favorite trainers, but you really try everything um, when it comes to reviewing shoes. Is there one shoe that you can think of that surprised you the most over the past year? Yeah, let me, I'm gonna look at my notes because there's so many and, um, well, yeah, uh, in terms of the shoes that shocked me, uh, obviously the 10.9 from Hoka, uh, which was sort of like the Meta Ride from Asics, an extreme expression of something they're working on. In ASIC's case, it went over to the incredible Glide Ride, uh, the Evo Ride, and now the Meta Racer and more toned down. Um, it was, it, that's a it, radical, radical concept, maybe taken a little far, but that they wanted to make a statement. So the next statement of that, that we can, whoops, let me get in front, would be our um, Clifton Edge with that similar uh, cantilever geometry. I think we're going to see Hoka uh, work on that because what it does, uh, it, see more of it. What it does is it allows a very wide platform and a very light foam with some stability. This shoe is much more stable. If I get my weights, I may get my weights wrong. Approximately the same as the Clifton 7, much more stable uh, with a lighter foam. So it's another way to get at um, some of the things that the plate does, but for more heel, heel striking and regular running. Uh, out of the box, the two shoes that um, kind of, you know, for kind of running I like to do that struck me were, again, the Fuel Cell TC and the Endorphin Speed. They're just a joy to run in. Um, that Meta Racer, the total polish, and it's hard to see, of the upper. You know, when I think back to the 70s and uppers, this, it's hard to see, but this engineered mesh upper is a thing of beauty and elegance and just wonderful fit. That's the class in terms of a race upper, uh, for me anyway, right now. Uh, and then finally, the unexpected, you know, uh, that Exodus 10 we talked about, 
Um, and then the, the nice folks at ASICS uh, begged, <laughs> no, they didn't beg, but they encouraged us to uh, test the um, Cayano 27. I had stayed away from it. It scared me that with all that, look at that plastic and, ooh, and the heel thing. Guess what? A wonderful stability shoe that for a neutral runner gave me some co extra confidence when I needed it. Uh, uh, something that I like, a really good rear hold with the flexibility up front. Any stability shoe that doesn't, that, uh, doesn't give me flexibility up front, I can't stand. A real surprise given I'd never run in one 27 editions. Uh, 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 just a solid all around trainer, uh, kind of a recovery type shoe for me. So it's a thing of elegance, beauty, and refinement as that Meta Racer is. Uh, is it the most exciting shoe out there? No, but it's, it's solid, durable comfort. Uh, you know, the beginner runner, heavier runner, or for recovery, you really can't do, go wrong with this Cayano. And I was very surprised. Didn't think I'd like it at all. Wow. So lots of shoes that surprised you this year, but it sounds like the 10.9 was the most surprising. And I, that doesn't surprise me either because it is such a shocking shoe. And you're seeing that technology, as you said, kind of cycle down into the, some other shoes. And I think we're seeing a lot of brands do that right now. They take a shocking piece, something really innovative, and then use that innovative technology to get into more niche or more niche products, but also more products for the general public. So that's interesting to see. But uh, was there a shoe that was the biggest letdown for you? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, to uh, talk about a category of shoes that don't work for me uh, and with some examples. Um, many of the brands have uh, moved to uh, uh, rails, uh, plastic pieces on the, mainly on the medial side or firmer foam to stabilize the knee instead of control pronation. Uh, and none of them really work for me. Um, they, they, they really are in the way, especially if there's no, uh, um, if the flex doesn't start uh, early enough. Um, so I can't say I hated it, but the Infinity, um, the React Infinity, uh, I really felt those lateral rails, it kind of spoiled it. I kind of prefer the Miler, the little bit heavier Miler. Uh, some of the Brooks, better in version two, the rails are softer. Um, but the idea of controlling the knee, it may be very useful and helpful to people, preventing injuries, but um, I, I, it, it's not an issue for me, 50 years, my knees so far are great. Um, so it, it, it maybe puts some of the stability and support shoes into a more niche category uh, in terms of feel. Um, but I will say, uh, not a letdown, but another way to look at that problem is the Ultra Provision 4, I think I got it right, which um, has a foam, foam rail here that's very soft. Uh, it's unnoticeable. And then it also has these, uh, you can see the white straps, which tie into a, let me turn it around basically an arch band, uh, oops, the other way. <laughs> There's an arch band that reaches underneath on the med medial side and wraps around your foot, ties in to the, the white pieces. Um, a different approach to stability and support feels like a very neutral shoe to me. Um, and it's another way of looking at it. Okay. Also, I would say a lot of the support in, comes from the, this really wide, band here, this overlay, that's one solid overlay. Um, a, not a disappointment, but a, another way to wrinkle that, that kind of category. Yeah, stability is something right now that seems to be changing. We're seeing a lot of companies innovate in the stability category. And, uh, you know, it sounds like some worked for you, some didn't. Right. Um, but overall, right now, a lot of good shoes on the market, and it's an exciting time to be a runner. But let's look on into the future, the next year, what are you uh, most excited about um, in terms of shoes coming out and just overall brand uh, offerings? Sure. Um, well, there, there's one super shoe we haven't tried yet, which is New Balance's RC. Uh, after the TC, 
uh, I imagine it'll be much lighter, but a similar ride. Very excited to, to, to test that. Um, in terms of brands, um, it, it's, it's almost hard to predict. You know, it's hard to predict. Uh, I'm very excited to try the Alpha Fly and the Tempo Next from Nike. Um, those are radical looking shoes. I haven't worn them or tried them, so, uh, but I would include those in the shocking category. Uh, the two brands, um, two brands that I, I think we need, that I will keep a close eye on are, uh, are uh, Hoka and Skechers in the next year. Um, I think, uh, but I think they all could surprise. Uh, Asics is on a roll. They've been on a roll now with every, every single shoe. Some people really like the Nova Blast. Our crew really like them. I found them a little, a little narrow and un, uh, unstable underfoot, but, but Asics is getting in the game. Um, I'd love to see something from Mizuno. Uh, I'm hoping. Um, but, uh, Skechers and Hoka are on the radar. Um, Saucony has had a tremendous uh, year so far with the Endorphin series. We can talk about the trail shoes. I already mentioned the Exodus. Um, they completely revamped all their shoes and every single, so far, every single update, change, new shoe has been a home run. So who knows what they're coming up with next. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think all the brands you just mentioned, uh, Hoka, Skechers, Saucony, they're, they're shoes that I get a little bit sneak peek, I get to test, and from what I've seen so far, things are looking very strong, so, you know, everyone's going to have to step it up, because right now the brands are just bringing the fire, so really excited to see that coming in the future, but um, that's just more uh, on the road side, but let's move on to the trails, there's a lot of exciting stuff yeah. on the trails, you are okay. a trail guy. <laughs> you are a trail guy. So let's let's start on off first. Um, what kind of trails are you running on mostly uh, in New Hampshire? Okay. Well, I'm not in New Hampshire. I'm in Utah. So the picture is completely different. <laughs> uh, I'm almost too old to run New Hampshire trails. New Hampshire trails are rocky, rooty, wet often, buggy, no views unless you really work for them. I used to run all the White Mountains, you know, I, I, I don't, they didn't have fastest known times, but I was pretty fast. So uh, very much uh, different in, in the type of shoe that people say on the East Coast use versus uh, here in Utah, in, in Park City where I am now today. Those are machine built single tracks. They're built with a small bobcat. There's a few rocks here and there, uh, but generally it's a consistent grade. There are switchbacks. You can run fast. Some places are rocky. Yeah, they're, they're not all like that. Um, so you really, it's a different animal. Um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share with you some of the Utah shoes uh, that I've enjoyed and then some comments about the New Hampshire ones. So today, because they just came in, I ran in the let me turn it uh, this way. The Saucony Switchback 2. Okay. This is a really cool shoe. Version 1 was an ISO upper. I have it here somewhere, but um, ISO upper and Everrun. So Saucony's replaced all their Everrun midsoles, TPU. I found it hard, heavy, stiff with this new Power Run, um, Power Run Plus which is still TPU, it's a beaded kind of thing, a bit firmer than Boost. So this is a BOA upper. And what I noticed today in this great little shoe is with this BOA upper, essentially you don't have any laces over the The cords cinch down side. So, right? So it's a completely different feel over the foot in the sense that you don't have the sense of any laces. It's just a wrap of the foot. Uh, the other cool thing about this shoe is, I think, the rock plate, which is a woven braided material. Maybe hard to see. You can see the green in there. It, 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 it's both a rock plate and it's also a little bit of a propulsion plate. You know, we talked about nylon plates, a little bit less aggressive than, say, the... Um, 
Skechers Speed Trail, which has a nylon plate. Um, I was amazed. This is a uh, 2218, 22 millimeter heel, 18 millimeter forefoot, four millimeter. I was amazed how plush they felt. I, I had a great run. We're at about 6,800 feet. So all single track, about 550 feet of climbing. I was well under 10 minute miles, which was great. Felt plush, felt secure. A really neat new offer. Um, it competes in the light and fast category with, pardon the dust, but <laughs> with the Solomon Sense Pro 4, which has a somewhat stiffer, but film-based rock plate, a bit more aggressive traction. Again, a great up with the place. Uh, I have a, I'm gonna do a trail half here, virtual, here this month. Um, the triple trail series starts it, so I'll be here for the half. Um, and it, I'm, I'm, it's a toss up between this guy and the, um, and the Saucony. Uh, this one will catch you up on more rugged terrain. It, it, the OptiVibe works well. It's a firmer, denser feel, whereas that little Saucony is kind of a plush feel, very stable, very secure. But this one, a little more towards the rugged side of things. Uh, very much enjoying my runs in this one. Now, uh, one that's really, really surprised me is the Brooks Caldera 4. Um, if you pick it up, you'll see it's a stiff profile uh, kind of shoe. It has a very wide base, uh, practically hoka wide. It's an amazingly smooth running shoe. Um, plenty of cushion, tons of kind of inherent stability from the broad platform. Very uh, comfortable mesh upper here. Uh, this one has really surprised me. It's been a, a, a great shoe here in Park City. It has plenty of traction for New Hampshire too. So um, typically in New Hampshire, we see a lot of uh, La Sportiva is often very popular. Um, Another one that I've uh, hike run in the White Mountains is the Solomon XA Alpine, you know, which has a uh, some climbing rubber, a great uh, that one that one climbing in a great kind of very comfortable yet secure upper. Um, now um, let's take a look here. Uh, oh, I didn't bring it out, but the uh, Merrill Long Sky MTL Long Sky um, light. A very nice midsole, runs well on the road as well. Maybe not quite the forefoot stability of some of the others. There's no plate, but I've enjoyed running that one in recent weeks. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen to it, but one of my big favorites uh, for New Hampshire and also for Utah, the Evo Speed Goat from uh, Hoka. Uh, I haven't run in the Ultra Timp uh, 2 yet, uh, but I suspect I would like it. Uh, and then, of course, back to the light and fast, the Skecher Speed Trail, which, which is really a fun shoe here in Park City. Uh, yeah, the, the Speed Trail, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it is, um, in a sense, it's got the hyperburst and uh, a plate, uh, not quite a carbon fiber plate, but similar in, in concept. Do you think we're going to start seeing more of these super foams and carbon plate designs moving on onto the trail for performance? I do. Um, you know, uh, you've got the hyperburst uh, midsole, which is the rear, the front's the ultra flight, which is a little denser. So that plate in that little shoe provides both propulsion and some protection. It's decently flexible as well. So I don't have it here, but in flexibility, it sits uh, between the um, uh, Solomon Sense Pro 4 and the uh, the switchback um, two. Um, so yes, I do. Because trail shoes often have a rock plate of some kind. Sometimes it's hardened EVA, Sportiva uses that. Uh, sometimes it's a, a nylon or plastic. Uh, Solomon, it's a film of some kind. The, the, the um, Saucony, it's like a woven braided. Um, so I, what I would, be looking for is where the plate 
or the film or the braided thing provides both protection, propulsion, but also you got to think in a trail shoe, you can either go with kind of a stable single platform or ground feel, you know. Um, now, the, typically, the more ground feel you have, the less midsole you have, and the more rocks you feel, e plate or no plates. And then the plate in the mix gets stiff. So it, they'll, they're working. I, I, they're, I'm sure they're working. And we're seeing some new things. The woven plate in the Saucony, the uh, nylon plate or whatever it is, um, P-backs, P-backs maybe, in the Skechers. Yes. Yeah. A lot of exciting things to come. So I think we just got to kind of sit back and wait to see what the brands give us. But, uh, you know, overall, really exciting time for shoes. And, you know, I think we could sit here all day and, and talk about our favorite shoes because, you know, it's it just the list goes on and on. But we're going to move on forward and go to our fan questions. We reached out on social Great. and we got we got some good questions for you, Sam. So oh first on up, what is your top three best bang for your buck shoe so someone who maybe doesn't have as much money what do you got for them well um i don't have a pair of the of the current version but our all our testers i did the last brooks rebel three or four no question for a hundred bucks it's about as much fun as you can you can have um uh the uh Another that you might, uh, of course, the, the Reebok um, uh, uh, Float Ride Energy is also in there at about a, at about 100. Uh, in terms of um, thinking here, you've also got to think sort of about value, right? And versatility. And I didn't quite get to get to it in the trail category. Uh, and I don't, the price is up there. But again, this Exodus 10, you know, a shoe that could take you literally over any mountain for your recovery runs, would be a decent road trainer if you don't mind a heavier shoe. Uh, you know, so sometimes value is not just, ab it's not just absolute price, it's what you can get out of it. There are some shoes that are limited, you know, quite frankly, in their versatility at a, at a high price and that's a tougher decision for people yeah yeah value definitely is a big part of it because you might be paying a little bit more money but they might be more durable they might be better for more uses so that is something to keep in well, mind one other here uh, connor you know because um i've been so impro i don't know where it is oh here it is <laughs> let's not forget that pegasus 37 for women for 120 bucks okay look at all that outsole rubber Okay, uh, and the zoo, the Zoom Air and the React. This thing is going to last a long time. I'm I'm convinced of it. Yeah, the, the, value. Pegasus, the Pegasus has been a favorite uh, of many for years, and I think this recent 37 uh, is going to continue on the legacy. So I'm excited to get my own uh, pair to get some miles in. Uh, next question we've got. Uh, Sam, are you currently testing any shoes that are not out on the market yet? And I, I imagine there's some you can't speak of, but uh, is there any that you're currently testing? Yes. Lay it on us. I can't. Oh, uh, no, not, well, you mean not on the market. Um, they, they've been disclosed. I'm, I'm testing shoes that haven't been disclosed. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there were a bunch here. The, the, the Endorphin Speed isn't quite out yet. Um, uh, is the Meta Racer not quite? Not quite. Not quite. The this, the Meta Racer. Uh, but let's uh, let me. One shoe we didn't talk about was the Adi Zero Pro. Now I don't think you have a pair, but it, is that is that something that oh, you're looking forward to? Yes, I am. Um, I would. I'm going to be comparing that most closely to the Meta Racer, um, because my understanding is it has a, kind of a boost core and a light strike carrier with more boost at the heel and more, uh, and there's a plate. Um, the, it's, light strike is an interesting material. It, it reminds me uh, of what night, sort of, and fuel cell, we don't know what's in fuel cell, but um, that it can be configured in different ways. So uh, for example, I don't have them with me, but the SL20 is a very firm shoe. That would be one I would consider for a 10K, even though it's 
heavier, but not much beyond for racing. It is super snappy, but it is firm. However, and I don't know if Running Warehouse is going to carry them, but uh, this is the Terex, um, Terex 2 Boa, also with a light strike midsole, slightly softer uh, light strike. And Jeff Valeri and I who tested this, fantastic heavy duty trail shoe. Now, how do they make it softer? Well, it, it does feel like that light strike is softer. I think there's another layer, the black layer, maybe a softer also, a softer EVA. Um, but also what they did is it's, it's a continental rubber outsole that's relatively soft as well. Super plush ride. So, and that's light strike, just like the, the uh, SL20, just like what's in the Adi Zero Pro. Yeah, Adidas has been using Light Strike and Boost, um, Boost for years, and Light Strike more recently. Both great compounds, responsive, fun to run in. Um, I think there's more room for growth for Adidas, and I I know from what we've heard so far, they are looking into more compounds. And I think in the next year or so, we could see some some pretty big jumps from Adidas as well. So I, I think that's another right. brand to to keep in mind. I think we'll see it first in Trail because um, I previewed the Trail line at the um, at um, at the running event, and uh, I was very, very impressed. That's the first one I've, I've tried. So yeah. let, we need, Adidas needs to get back in the game too. Definitely, definitely. We're, we're, waiting, we're waiting to see Adidas make some moves because, you know, they were a major player back in the 70s when, when you were in your heyday. And, they, they, you know, they, they've slacked a little bit recently, but I, I think we could see some, uh, some big moves being made in the future. All right, final question we got for you today. What is the best trail to run in in the United States, and what shoe would you wear? Oh, my goodness. Well, I haven't been as much to Colorado or, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to talk Utah. Um, uh, I haven't run it yet this year because the snow's still still on it, but I think within the next week. But one of my, my favorite runs uh, here in Park City um, is um, – uh, a two tr three trail combination. Basically, it's a about a seven and a half mile climb with about three thousand feet of vertical. Consistent grade. The trails are built by machine. We're all built by machine, except for one little section. So it's very consistent. All mountain bikeable. That's a good sign for money. So it's the Armstrong Trail um, that leads to a section of the Mid Mountain Trail, which is a 20, well, now it's 40 miles long, but it's a, basically a marathon length trail from Deer Valley to the canyons that's raced on. I've raced it several times. People often get close to three hours on that thing at 8,500 feet. It's amazing. Uh, there's one rocky section, bad, for about four miles that would keep me from saying it's the best trail because it, it cramps me up every time. Super rocky. But, um, but that Armstrong uh, to to um, uh, Mid-Mountain, and then um, it's called the, uh, is it the Porcupine? I think it's the Porcupine Trail that leads up to the ridge at the highest point, Scotts Hill, uh, in Park City, about 10,000 10, feet even. Uh, it's a beautiful climb. And then to get down, you either run down the miles or you know, go across the ridge a mile, stick your thumb out, or have a car and come down Guardsman past so it's a consistent great trail uh, the shoe i would wear right now which i will wear especially if i'm just doing the climb uh would be a toss-up uh between those three light ones i talked about the sense pro four the Saucony switchback two or the sketchers um and uh i would i'm i gotta run the the Saucony a bit more, but I, given the downhill sections, if I run it back down, I think I, and it's not technical, I might lean towards the, um, the switchback because it is really for such a small shoe, really plush also. So we'll see. Good question. Perfect. Well, if I ever come and visit you in Utah, you'll have to take me on that trail and uh, show me what it's all about. But <laughs> uh, my pleasure. Any of the crew at Running Warehouse or awesome. anybody else. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. Well, that's, that's about all the time we have today. But for people who want to find out more about you, where can they find you on social media? Sure. Um, 
so you can find uh, Road Trail Run uh, on as Road Trail Run, all one word, on uh, on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. It's it's RoadTrailRun.com, but you'll find us. You see the green logo. Um, uh, Twitter as well, and of course at our website road, uh, RoadTrailRun.com. And uh, we're always interested in hearing from readers. Try our best to answer questions. Our whole team. And it's, it's really, it's fun to keep running and, and competing. Perfect. Like, I, I know you got some big races coming up, so we'll keep an eye on you. Looking forward to the new reviews, new shoes. I know you, you have a pair of Alpha Flies that you're, you're hoping to come, come your way pretty soon. So, you know, we're looking forward to see what's, what's next for Road Trail Run. So, Thanks, Connor. Yeah, thank thanks you again for coming for out. Yeah, th thanks again for coming out. We appreciate your time and until next time, that was the Running Warehouse Connection.